Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, thank you, everyone at TechChill, for having us. And uh, I'm super, super excited for the discussion. One of the topics I'm personally very, very uh, interested in, and uh, one of the topics or, or one of the discussions we need to have as a world today. And um, because a lot of a lot, there is a lot of inequalities in the world today, and we I think we should address it. I'm very happy this panel is addressing one of the core issues in, in, the, in our world today, which is basically not being diverse enough or not being equal in the funding world. And for me personally, I think quality starts with economical uh, equality. Everyone should, ha should, should have access to the same, uh, let's say, playground or same access to money, same access to resources, so they can, they can all succeed in, 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 um, in their careers or in their companies. So today I have four amazing speakers. Kinja of, of Xperia F Venture Fund. I have L Lina of ISIF Ventures, Mariel of Karma Ventures, and Christy. And I'm super, super excited to, to have a discussion with those amazing ladies. So I'm going to start with asking them to introduce them themselves, what they have done so far in their, in their careers and their lives, and uh, their backgrounds. So maybe we can start with Christy. Uh, yeah, sure. Happy, happy to begin. Uh, so my name is Christy Kruvitz. Uh, I'm from Estonia originally. Uh, my background uh, is actually in aviation, and this is where I got my start in education from. Um, for the last seven, eight years, I've been primarily in very male-dominated industries, and um, for the last four years, I've been uh, working with um uh vc firms international vc firms and startups and what i've seen obviously is diversity is a big issue and um i want i've been working on you know supporting female founders and supporting uh unrepresented founders to kind of help them navigate through this system uh of you know very inequal yeah unequal um uh, ecosystem so um yeah, that's that's me. Okay, let's go to Lina. Thank you. Um, yeah, I currently work at ASIF Ventures, which is quite a special fund because we focus on student and recent graduate founded companies in the Amsterdam metropolitan area. And uh, in my role, I focus on diversity and inclusion, which I think is extremely exciting because we sit at a very early uh, stage in the pipeline. And I think therefore can also make quite a big impact when it comes to founders, but ASIF is also a springboard for young people to kind of enter the VC world. Um, and therefore, once again, I think there's a big opportunity uh, within ASIF itself to create more diverse venture capitalists, so to say, of the future. Um, yeah, my background, I worked with the G20 when I was a bit younger on the labor inclusion of young women, um, which was Really, really interesting. I also founded my own foundation called Youth Act, which works to increase diversity at decision-making tables. And uh, yeah, super excited to be here today. Wow, amazing. I, and I love how you're addressing the pipeline from, and I, I think it's one of the uh, the key things to, to, to look into in the future, like where just make the pipeline itself diverse and hopefully things in, on later stages can be, uh, can be more, automatically more diverse. Okay, Morelli, and I hope I'm saying your name right. Go yes. ahead. Hello, hello. It, it is very rightly uh, pronounced. But hello, everyone. So I'm Morelli. I'm from Karma Ventures. Um, we're a Europe-focused uh, deep tech, mostly software funds. Uh, so the, the investments that we make uh, are into companies that are typically targeting enterprise customers. And really the core of the, of the business is usually is like innovation. It's it's a technology that is really disruptive and, and defensible at the same time. Um, we, we cover late seed and day round. Um, and yes, so the, I, I joined the fund uh, almost five and a half years ago. Uh, prior to that, uh, I, was, uh, I was living in Switzerland and worked at UBS, Investment Banking and Wealth Management. And I would say like this diversity, uh, gender diversity was the first time at UBS 
that, that, that I countered. And it was, it was like female uh, executives coming together, sharing their experiences and very inspirational in a way that we had uh, different conferences where, um, where female that were, yes, mostly working in male dominated industries uh, were sharing their experiences. And again, a lot to learn, uh, but it wasn't as, as let's say sharply discussed uh, 10 years ago as it is today. So very happy to see the development and overall see the positive development. I'll come back to male dominance, dominant industries for you and Christy in a bit, but I want to go to Kinja to, uh, and I'm also hoping that I'm pronouncing her name right. No, to introduce you're her. not. I'm not, right? No. How, how I should pronounce no, it? Kinga, like a king. Okay, Kinga, okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here. I think my Arabic just, just interfered in my English. Because we we have a different G in Arabic. Okay, all right. Well, uh, glad to be here anyway uh, with everyone. Um, I am the founder and general partner of Exterior VC based in Warsaw. I'm also the founder of European Women in VC, which is a platform which um, has a name to increase the number of females across the VC ecosystem. And uh, I'm an independent investment committee member at EIC Fund, which is uh, owned by the European Commission. It's a new 4 billion euro fund investing into deep tech startups across Europe, but also with a big aim to uh, invest and help female founders move forward to their companies. Uh, so I think that that also will be an amazing new platform for female founders to grow faster, especially in the deep tech space. Amazing. I'm just going to go to uh, Christy briefly and Marily, because honestly, the, 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 the male dominance part is almost important, always important for females. How do you guys thrive in such an environment? How, how as a female, you address that? Who, who would like to go first? Oh, yeah, sure. Or yeah, Christy, go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so actually, it's, it's really interesting because throughout kind of the first part of my career, I really thought that was the norm. I, I think I was very much also uh, caught by my own biases of those industries. And, and I think that drove me through for quite a while. And it wasn't until I, I joined Hearst Lab, which is uh, a US uh, corporate venture capital firm focusing only on female founders, that I fully understood really the depth of the issue uh, and not only gender diversity, but you know, ethnic, uh, yeah, ethnic diversity, socioeconomic diversity, network, you know, knowledge, everything. And uh, for me, it has been, what has been really helpful for me has been having mentors and having mentors from different backgrounds to really help me excel and, and kind of, championed me through, you know, throughout this, uh, the road that I've taken. And, and this is something that I value a lot giving back. And, and this is something that I've taken on myself now as well, helping founders. Cool. Marily? Yeah, I mean, the word male dominance, uh, I think I adopted this only a few years ago, because I must really say I haven't felt that uh, in, in my life, at least in my professional life that much. Um, or, or maybe I've been a bit blind to this because I've been always like passionate about investing. And I always thought like, you know, if you're passionate about something that somehow you will manage uh, one way or another. And, and I would say like, you know, this has not, at least if this has not stopped me to, to let's say achieve what I want to achieve, but definitely like, um, you know, the, the diversity overall, and I would really kind of expand this from uh, gender diversity to all sorts of other diversities um, and, and minorities. I think this is a topic and, and I'm not sure that the whole industry is mindful about that. So we put a lot of emphasis on, on genders, but again, I, at least for myself, I've emphasized that there are many, many other uh, other like you know sub segments or, or minorities to address too. So that's my two cents on that. 
thank you. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna go to uh, everyone of you guys again uh, to explain a bit what you guys do at your work uh, in 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 details to address inequality or 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 less diverse either either. Uh, let, let's focus on our our topic, which is funding and females in in the venture world. So I'm gonna start with Kinga, and I'm, I hope I see the try this time. You do it amazing, Mo. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's interesting to just briefly touch upon the recent research that we've done as European Women in VC that was launched in March. It covers the whole of Central and Eastern Europe, and we took data from uh, 900 companies and around 80 funds um, with the help of DealRoom slash Invest Europe and a couple of other partners. So uh, this data is unfortunately not all that optimistic. Um, what we have seen is that in 2020, only around 1% of all venture capital investment went to female-led companies, and 94% went to male-only companies. 1% um, is so insignificant that actually- you the number also in the MENA, like last, last month, April, we track this like on a monthly basis, in April, less than 1% went to a females only, and the most devastating is less than 1% went to mixed gender teams. Like, it's not only like females alone. Like, if yeah. you have a female founder, you're also not getting money, which is for me, like, this one, to be specific, 1.2% of the total funding went to yeah. females only or mixed gender, which is for me, like, devastating. Yeah, now, 2020 wasn't any different than other years. And it's actually not that different whichever country across Europe you go to, whether that's gonna be 1% or 2% or 3%, we're still talking about a very, very low single digit percentage going to female led, female funded startups. Um, but there is a, a huge positive behind this because when we did research with Slush about the outperformance of female-led companies, we came to the conclusion that for each euro that is spent on a female-led company, actually they perform twice as well as male-led ones. So the difference is two times. Um, and and that, that is great because that's great news. That means that we should be investing in females more. Why? Because it's good business. It's not charity. It's not that we are doing something that makes no financial sense. It actually makes great financial sense because on a revenue basis to invested dollars, females outperform males in Central Europe by two times and in the Nordics by around 50%. So those are two very, very interesting numbers that you need to keep in mind. Now on the VC side, now I'm switching over to what the VC environment looks like in terms of general partners and in terms of mixed teams. So what we found is that male-led and only male VCs um, are obviously over 90 something percent of all venture funds out there. But what is more important is that the pure male-led VCs have around five times more assets under management. They have five times more capital to invest than the, than the female-led ones. So what that means is that the male-led ones are able to invest more initially, larger rounds, they're able to do follow-ons and therefore can easier prove a success because they can stay with the companies longer. And we know how VC works. You need to find your best company, your stars in your portfolio, and you need to keep backing them as long as possible. But female-led VCs cannot do that because of the numbers in terms of assets under management. They are basically not raising funds. And that is something that's a huge challenge in Europe. Uh, it's a ch huge challenge globally, but definitely a huge challenge in Europe when it's exacerbated by the fact that when funds go out fundraising, they hardly ever get asked any question about 
any kind of diversity, whether it's gender or any other type of diversity on the actual management teams of the VC funds. So the LPs are also in Europe not asking that question. And that's from the research which is available on the Xperia website. Thank you, Kenya, for such amazing work. And um, I think um, uh, it, it's very important, such work, to understand what is the current situation. Because if we're not tracking the situation, people will come and say female, female founders are out there. And there is like, and one of those numbers like that are being spread now is like there is 20, 30 percent female founders. But sorry, guys, you're like th those 30 percent female founders are getting one percent of the money, which is which is totally unfair. So I'm just going to go to Lena to hear from her, hear, hear what, what, what they do at ISIF uh, Ventures and uh, what they're trying to address the devastating situation you just mentioned. Yes. So I think uh, ASIF has quite a special function because I think as a VC firm, unlike most other VC firms, we have the opportunity to really actively create our own deal flow. And what I mean by that is that the mission of ASIF in a way is to spur entrepreneurship. We work very closely with the two biggest universities here, the UFA and the FU in Amsterdam, um, and host a lot of different events and try to build an entrepreneurial community to also mobilize new talent and inspire new demographics to become entrepreneurs. And that's what I actively do in my role. So that means that sometimes we invest in people and then three years down the line, they end up in our deal flow funnel. And I think that's something that later stage VCs often don't have the capacity to do, but maybe also don't feel the responsibility to be actively involved in spurring entrepreneurship. And I think that's something that needs to change, which is why we work very closely with later stage investors uh, for two reasons. One being, of course, that when we do have great female founded companies, we want them to get follow-up funding from really great people who can, yeah, take over the seat that we've taken at the table, because I think there's a limit to how much value we can provide as a fund. And um, so what that means is, uh, yeah, we basically started a diversity task force together with Antler here in the Netherlands, where we work with bigger VC funds on different pain points that venture, cap uh, yeah, that venture capital funds face in sourcing, let's say, diverse teams, once again, also going beyond gender, for example, founders of color. Etc. Um, and now we have different working groups where we're yeah, trying to accelerate uh, the pace at which we can source such companies. And for ASIF, it's a big benefit because we can once again access the university talent right away. Um, yeah, and I think apart from that, we're just really implementing a wider diversity, equity and inclusion strategy, which means that all of our directors um, yeah, have specific targets that they're really working towards, maybe building up new partnerships, new kinds of organizational knowledge, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what I've really seen at the beginning of the pipeline, there are a lot of problems. And as long as these problems prevail, they will also continue to exist at later stages. And I think there's almost like a collective action problem that, yeah, funds don't have the energy and time to invest at the earliest stage of the pipeline sometimes once again when someone isn't even an entrepreneur yet even though of course in theory you would have to start in kindergarten uh, to change all of this i think thank you uh, i'm just gonna have a follow-up uh, question on 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 the problems uh, that the founders are facing on early stage or investors are, are facing on early stage but i'd love to go to marilla and hear from her um, karma venture experience uh, and uh, actions toward uh, equality? Um, yeah, so I think like the biggest, um, biggest like uh, the way we, we, we try to address that unconsciously, I would even say is that it's, it's the decision making internally, how we, how we function as a fund. And we have put a lot of emphasis to really, um, uh, discuss every every startup or every investment opportunity together with the entire team. Uh, so what it means is that we try to uh, reduce the single individual uh, opinion or, or, or bias uh, to words like whether this is female or male uh, entrepreneur. And I would say like this has really like worked out really well because um, the, the discussions are diverse. Um, they are they are trying to incorporate everyone's opinion. And then by this mechanism, we make sure that we don't 
let's say we don't become biased and and miss like important just pure investment related to uh, like information and um, I, I would say like you know this is how how we have cope with this but we probably never put like uh, emphasis on on that so um yeah okay uh thank you so much uh christy you have more work on the ecosystem side um take me through what you what you do as an individual and what we should be doing as an ecosystem to address inequality yeah that's that's a great question i mean uh i think a good start was you know Prior to joining Hearst Lab, I used to work at Startup Bootcamp, which was a, we had tons of different teams from different backgrounds and locations. And uh, going from there to a fully female focused uh, fund, it was, uh, first of all, it was such an eye opener. And even then, you know, having a fund that only focuses on female led companies, you still have a lot of work to do when thinking through, you know, the processes of, okay, how do we get more minority founders? Like what is the pathway there? Um, so there's constant improvement, even in these kinds of funds that are trying to kind of bridge the gap uh, for VC funding. And I think one of the things that I've seen as well, um, that is a bit of a pitfall, I would say is, uh, a lot of times the ecosystems are, you know, built around big hubs, uh, like we have, you know, London or Amsterdam, Silicon Valley, New York, and so on. Uh, but it a lot of times disregards other locations and potential founders. Um, and I think localization is a very um, interesting approach there. How can you reach uh, those founders in different locations? And even within here in the Netherlands, you can clearly see everything is centralized around Amsterdam. Um, and, you know, thinking through how we can reach founders in different locations and also different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and I think for, for VCs and for the ecosystem, I think having goals and meaningful goals uh, and making sure they don't just become numbers, right? Because a lot of times, you know, diversity is in numbers and inclusions is what can you do with those numbers and, and how do you make it meaningful and how do you make it count within an organization or ecosystem? Um, so I think going through those different topics and, and trying to create a more inclusive ecosystem overall, because I think that creates more opportunities for raising capital. Uh, it creates more opportunities for inclusive tech. Um, and it creates more opportunities for for kind of the founders that are currently, you know, not looked at. Um, so I think these are kind of the maybe the few things uh, to think about. Um, and and overall, I think on an individual level, nurturing underrepresented talent or um, helping other founders, sharing knowledge, sharing ideas, uh, building your network. I think a lot of times with VCs, what I see, they have their own kind of comfortable pool that they're constantly fishing at. And then they're wondering, you know, why is there no diversity in their pipeline? Uh, and, you know, it's no surprise if they keep going back to the to the same pool. I think there is really, um, you know, broadening your networks and, and connecting with other VCs that have a bit of a different thesis than you do. But already that can give you a, a new perspective and a much more wider pool for, for your deal flow. Thank you, Christy. Um, I second what, everything you're saying about VCs diversifying their, their networks because some of them, the top VCs in the world and the most active ones are literally investing in the same countries, in the same cities, within the same networks, literally every every round or every or on, on, on every stage. Uh, Lina will have to leave us in a, in a few minutes. Um, I would love to go to back to her. Lina, what are the problems on every stage of they're causing that massive unequal in, in situation in funding on, on, on later on stages? And how, can be, how it can be addressed in your opinion? So I think in the specific field that I'm active with, you work with early stage companies, but also inexperienced young founders. So people who don't have a track record yet. And I think that that, when you are a female founder or a founder of color can cause additional problems in raising funding. Once again, because I think a lot of our bias can disappear if people have a significant track record. 
even though I think probably as a woman, you often have to, yeah, show that you can do much more than maybe the average white male, so to say. Um, and then I think the second big problem that we, of course, see is, yeah, the ways in which people display self-confidence may differ according to gender, the ways in which you do your projections, which especially in the beginning, you ha don't have a lot of metrics to actually prove this is how my product is performing, but it's a lot of wet finger work. And I think there, if you do have these inequalities, so to say, in, or differences in how people present themselves, that can have a big impact with regards to whether you get access to funding or not. And I think what I see here a lot is that people then think, okay, so let's go and fix women because they just need to be more self-confident. They need to go out there and pitch aggressively, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I sometimes find that a little bit problematic because I think it's actually really great to also create more space for feminine entrepreneurship, whatever that may mean. I think that can be quite a plural concept. And I don't want the only women to succeed in this world to be women who act like men. Um, so I think there it's really about educating the investors, so to say, which is, of course, a long term process and something that takes a lot of time and then once again making sure that especially with early stage investors you have funds or you have yeah diverse decision makers and, and once again not just women who already just made it in a male system because they have an easy time assimilating so to say to a masculine environment i think that's a dilemma that i see because i think sometimes you can have a lot of women you can even have women at um, the managing level but it can still be a very stringent non-inclusive culture and um, yeah so those would be my thoughts um one because you need to leave us uh one message you have for investors today if 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 you're if you if you if you're addressing every investor in the world and you want them to invest in more females what is one thing you would you would tell them yeah well christy i'm sorry i'm gonna steal something that you told me recently because i never forgot it after you said it um, which was investing in women is not charity. It's a billion dollar business. And of course, that's something that Kinga also already touched upon today. But I think even if we can't align on the morality or if we can't align on a lot of different, let's say, social questions around uh, diversity, inclusion, equality, if we can align on the business case, it makes sense to do it. So um, if you care about money as an investor, I think there's a very clear case for you uh, why you should invest in more women moving forward. Thank you so much for having me and sorry for having to drop out a little bit earlier, but I hope, uh, yeah, you have a nice rest of the panel and speak to you soon. Thank you, Lena, for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate your time. And um, I'll go now to Mirelli from Karma Ventures. Mirelli, there's many things um, Christy and, and Lena mentioned. One of it, one of it is the LBs. I personally believe that LBs plays a big role how how funds are being deployed, and 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 the other day I had a discussion with my my friends at the World Bank and we were discussing with the ecosystem players how we can how we can address that and everyone was like LBs should talk to their to their funds. What do you think LBs can do today? To make sure more females are getting are, are getting money, in we in case we agree that, actually as Kinga said, Kinga said that dollars are making more their their dollars in female founders are making more money than their dollars in male founders. Um, yes, uh, I think like this question should be also addressed to LPs <laughs> because like I'm I'm on a, on a on a fund side, but. I think clearly like overall like uh, investors from whom the money is coming, they can encourage like certain trends and behaviors in the industry. And here I think like LPs definitely have that, let's call it power to kind of force bigger shifts over, over shorter period of time in, in the whole industry. Um, but then I think at the same time, um, we see, and, and I think like looking at this from the LP's perspective, a fund is that is managing your money. It, it makes investment decisions and you need to have like a good feeling about the fund managers capable of doing those decisions. And I think like here, the time is helping us because um, I've seen like there are many, even if it's male-led funds, they are, they are making efforts to recruit um, 
uh, women into their investment teams. And I think like over time, these women will actually collect the understanding of how, how to actually be a partner level uh, in, uh, in a VC. So this will naturally like help uh, the transition in the, in the industry as well. But definitely, I, I remember once I heard that um, it, it was one of the uh, partners in, in a fund, women, saying that she needed encouragement to actually take up that role. And I think because she was before operational in an operational role in another corporate. Um, so it was very inspiring. And I think like LPs could actually put more emphasis on finding these women that have the skill set, but may not yet be on the position to think that they could actually be uh, um, on, on a GP side uh, as a partner, or then, you know, they haven't, let's say, uh, given the opportunity. So this this could be like um, one action that LPs could do. But overall, like I'm I'm positive that the industry is moving towards like a, let's say more balanced uh, gender solution over time. Thank you, um, Kinga. Uh, uh, I want to ask you what we can do as governments, corporates, or ecosystem to address the current situation, which is you portrayed very well uh, in, in a few minutes ago when you said the, the, the stats and the numbers and you, you, you looked at it from uh, equality point of view, you looked at it from an economically point of view, how we can take this to governments, how we can take this to corporates and what is the role can play here, they can play here? Well, um, I think that if we are thinking about the way the European VC is funded in general, a huge percentage of LP money is taxpayer money. Um, so whether that is a national fund of funds, a regional fund of funds, a local fund of funds, the EIF, it's ultimately all taxpayer money. And uh, Europe is in that sense different from the US. In the US, there are many privately owned investors. Here, not really. Family offices will still invest in other asset classes and they will put only small capital at risk into VCs. So that does mean that governments have a huge um, impact on what is being done. Unfortunately, right now, there hasn't been much movement there. There hasn't been much focus from that level. And uh, I think that is the level where we need to start asking the questions. We need to start making the data transparent we need to start putting KPIs onto things because that's the only way that we can deliver change. Today, we're still at a level of lack of clarity, lack of transparency and lack of data. Uh, and that is the, what is happening on the VC level. On the founder level, there is much more data, but not on the way that funds are managed. So I think that's the first thing. And the second thing is that everything starts where the money is. So uh, it flows down. If uh, institutions like governments or corporates want to see real change in the world, they want to see a sustainable future, they want to see a greener future, they want to see investments in education, they want to see investments in medical life sciences and so on, then look who invests there. The people that invest there are usually women-led funds or mixed teams. They're the ones that care the most about the future. And I'm not saying that on empty words, it's actually statistics. The people that care mo most about sustainability and will try to influence their portfolio companies to have more of an ESG strategy are exactly diverse and mixed teams. And unfortunately, no other group has been as good at this and data proves it. So if as the world or as a continent or as a country, we want to go more towards a green and sustainable future, then we need to back the people that are doing it already. That's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, you, you, you just put it in, a, in, uh, in the best possible way. Like if, if government is really keen about, especially governments and corporates are really keen about seeing that change, they're talking about, they definitely, as you said, need to invest in the people bringing it. Okay, Marilli, if, if, if as 
Queen King has said in, in her previous two answers, economically it's working. Like females are bringing more money back. And um, speaking of the future, they're helping more, making the future more inclusive, more green, more sustainable. Why in reality, the money is not going there or not even increasing because when we talk about 1% versus 99%, that's not a regular inequality. That's not like 55-45. That's a very significant inequality. Why this is happening and why it's not changing? Because I think we have been speak speaking about inequality in fundraising for like 10 years at least now. Mm. Well, I, I can only comment from uh, our own fund side, and uh, we are we are uh, investing into deep tech uh, software companies. So um, over there, like typically, is the the maturity stage of the companies where they already have some customers, and our let's say standard procedure is also to talk to customers and and try to understand whether the product or the technology has value. And I would say like this is really like balancing all. Like other topics around whether you know whether whether the gender is there or, or whatnot, but the fact, unfortunately, is that majority of those deep tech uh, software startups are uh, founded by male. And I would I would really go let's say down let's call it down to educational levels, also the upbringing, uh, the the education that you know the person chooses when when he or she grows up and um, so this a bit defines what type of or what gender founders do we see in our pipeline now i i fully agree that there are like women networks that share very actively uh deals there are very like many interesting deals and and deals with a very large upside potential that would be really like you know valuable to any vc um on, on that level, with some other funds, I have heard that, you know, um, female founders are much more challenged when it comes to, like, understanding whether the opportunity is there or not by the VC. And, um, but I mean, this, this already goes to, like, other subjects like psychology and, and how do we view genders at the time that we make decisions as, as human beings. Um, so I think uh, on, on a deep tech side, um, what what I would encourage is really like work on a much earlier years of, of the person education and the upbringing to really emphasize that every opportunity is open uh, for the person to pursue. And I think like so far we haven't been really good at this. But again, I would say that we are improving because there are many more women that participate in you know technology heavy. Um, uh, industries. So, no, if I can just add to that, um, there are areas in deep tech that, uh, because I agree with everything Marilee said, but there are areas in deep tech where you find more women. The I question just, is, areas. well, uh, for example, the question is, how do we get those companies funded? So, let's think about, for example, the female technology sector, something that's called femtech. Um, that is an area that focuses on the health of 50% of the global population. We are talking about fertility software, we're talking about period tracking, we're talking about menopause, we're talking about all medical and lifestyle sectors around that are specific to females. And also one of the most profitable industries in the world, like th those are, are very key industries from an eco economical point of view. Let's put aside gender. This is those are industries where investors can make a lot of return on investment, too. Well, that's right, because women actually are the users and they actually need this. So it's it's pretty seems pretty obvious thing. But nevertheless, it's not like. Uh, a lot, the, the investment into that area has grown a lot. It hasn't. It's growing very, very slowly. And why is that? Well, because there is the deep tech element to it, which requires clinical trials, which requires all those elements that then can deliver ultimately a diagnostics app. Uh, and the grants are not going to those researchers that are researching those areas. 
because if you are researching female health, you are not backed by grants. And, and that is a problem that we are already seeing at the early university stage level before we even have a startup that can become a company and, uh, and kind of, you know, move the solution into a, a real sellable uh, package, whether that's um, a software, a product or a solution, doesn't matter. We're already losing out on the research stage. And that is very significant. And that, that is something that also must be handled because we are talking about the health of 50% of the population. Interesting what you were mentioning about universities. But is this is happening because of lack of education when it's come to the people who are giving grants out or giving investment out or it's happening systematically or it's biased or it's what? Well, actually, it's very hard to test medical solutions on women. And I'm talking about any kind of um, uh, health related issues and any kind of medical trials because women's bodies are different and they go through cycles, they could be pregnant. So it's not a constant. Um, researchers don't like testing products, uh, medical products on women bodies. And therefore, even the contraceptive pills are tested on men, which seems quite funny. Um, it's turned out that, that apparently Viagra could be used for treating premenstrual stress, but it hasn't been really followed up in clinical trials because no one is funding those trials. So because of the way females are and because of the way their bodies work, it's not the best business to fund that rather than a, um, you know, a, um, a 30 year old man that weighs 75 kilos and that has one meter 80 in size. That's much more constant and easy to target, easy to measure, easy to calculate. So you're saying in a way or another, we're risking the health of 50%, 52% of the population of the world because we're not keen on testing stuff for women? Yes. Okay, that, that way worse than the 1% funding, honestly. Okay, Christy, you said, and it seems like you're known for it, investing in women is not a charity. What would you go and tell corporates when you're meeting with them uh, and you're trying to convince them to invest more in women. Because there's a lot of people out there in the world, females and males, trying to convince where they work, their managers or their governments or their or the corporates and their ecosystems to invest more in women. And the, usually, the, it seems to me at least, the best way is to convince them from an economical point of view. So go ahead and tell me what you usually do. What, what, what do you tell them? Well, one of the things that I kind of taken as a habit to do with whoever I talk with is challenge them on their idea of diversity. And I think that's something that um, a lot of organizations need to do is, is really to take a critical look at, you know, their processes, their networks, their biases, and really set a strategy from that point uh, that embraces the collision of differences and and creates an environment or ecosystem that drives, you know, the message of inclusion and diversity as a norm. Because right now it's still, you know, it's it's an exception in, in a lot of ways, right? That having a female founder, or having a diverse founder, as we see that from that 1% or, you know, in some cases, 2%. Um, and how we can really create a norm around it. And I think I do agree that you do need to use data. Data is probably the most powerful tools when you talk with investors. Uh, but I think it needs to be a combination of both because that information is out there. I feel like, you know, we've been speaking about it nonstop for the past couple of years that, you know, there's a gap in the VC ecosystem and yet there's, no change. I think even during COVID, we saw a decline rather than anything else. Um, so I think it's a combination of both. It's really trying to figure out the unconscious biases and uh, and how, you know, really shifting the understanding of the ecosystem. And I think that really starts from having diverse teams, having diverse investment teams. Because if you don't have diversity there, it will be a very, very, very slow change. Um, so I think that's a good place to start with. And if that's too much, then having, you know, um, diverse analyst team or having a diverse network, um, 
And even having a diverse pipeline will bring you more, you know, founders um, that have a similar profile, right? So it's there's there's multiple levels of impact, and I can imagine some might be seem a bigger lift than others, and but there's already smaller steps that you can do, and purely starting with with networks, if you know if changing your team dynamics is is too much. Even if you're about to look for a team, I think, um, yeah, there's, th I, and also I think I can't stretch this enough. This, this, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. I think this will, this will take a while, you know, to get us there. And even, you know, throughout the way, I think it's important to kind of embrace the small wins that we have here. Um, but, you know, it, it is a long way to go. Thank you, Christy. I'm just going to go to Morelli and... Christy touched upon the in inclusion in workplaces, and I, I do personally believe it's the second most important thing after having like some sort of an equality when it's come to economic the, 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 the economy. How do you, how how can we change our teams to more inclusive teams versus diverse teams? Because honestly, most of the corporates in the world will come today and tell me, "Look, we have 40, 50 percent of our workplace females. Stop nagging on us." And I always respond, guys, do you have 50% females? None of them on C-level, none of them on the director level, a few on the managerial level. So they're technically not taking any decisions and not, not, most of the money in the company is not going to them. It's not, it's not truly an inclusion. And this is why we're seeing most of the diversity programs collapsing, even when it's come to minorities, not only when it's come to women. So really what we can do to, to have a much inclusive workplace. Yeah, I, I would say that first of all, you know, as a, as a whole team, or at least then the management team should really think like, you know, why are we doing this? And then you mentioned very correctly, like just ticking boxes somewhere to get the quotas and, and some paperwork perhaps like, you know, uh, complied with some rules. This is not, this is not what we are trying to achieve, right? So I would say like, you know, everybody should ask like, why is this necessary? What can it bring to us on a positive note? And, and I think like in a workplace, you know, if the team really actually sits down and, and, and tries to define what skill set is actually needed, then I think like during that exercise, when, when you brainstorm about this, you should come to understanding that, you know, diversity brings more options and in a way like better workplace, better decision making and better like long term uh, growth and success, whether this is now a startup or, or, a, or a fund or maybe an LP in, in that context. But I think like oftentimes we have we have lost that that first step, which is like asking why. And I think, that, you know, answering the why question should should solve many problems over here. Thank you. Uh, Kinga, my last question for you. Um, we, both both Christy and Murley agreed on the importance of diverse workplace. And the pe people who usually control workplace are, are people at HR level uh, or at HR teams. And what, what will be your message for those guys from attention and attractive attracting certain kind of employees and how inclusion can help them attract some of the best or retain their best employees? Well, um, I think that what we can do and, and what we can advise corporates is that it's worth making sure that employment offers are targeted towards everyone, um, that we are not by accident it's not uh, it's not that somebody means this but accidentally there are certain things that are often put in job offers that means one group is excluded unintentionally uh, or finds it harder to uh, to apply for certain jobs and I think that sometimes you need to go out of your way a little bit to make sure that you do have a diverse pool of candidates to choose from and then it's only fair that the best candidate wins uh, that's not a process that anyone wants to um, interfere with. But what we are seeing is that definitely starting from the top, having a diverse board at the company level is already pushing certain changes through because diverse board members usually ask different questions. 
They will ask questions about the further employment of more junior staff. They will be asking questions how that is handled. They'll be asking questions how issues are handled during the pandemic, for example. Um, how it's possible to have more flexible working hours. How is it possible for women to be able to uh, manage their, um, their home life and their work life? They will be asking those questions. So it's really worth having a diverse board membership, that's for sure. And it's worth thinking about those job offers, making sure that they are seen as attractive to a wide group of potential candidates so that they can then apply for those job offers. And I think that that really gives a lot because what we have learned, and these, this is data, this comes from McKinsey, comes from BCG studies, is that mixed teams, diverse teams, with people from different backgrounds, different races, different genders, outperform the standard teams. So whenever we can be open to others, we should be very open because diversity delivers a lot of value. And that's not me saying that's that studies McKinsey, BCG, and many, many others. I'm muted. Thank you, Kinga. Uh, I'm just gonna go for every one of you guys. Uh, just one message you would like to deliver to um, to investors today to have a more equal uh, funding landscape, whether for a woman or the rest of the other minorities out there. And let's start with Christy. Yeah, I, I think we've, we've touched upon quite a few of these. I think, uh, you know, really showing it is a good business investing in diverse teams. It's it's not only, you know, it's for diversity, it's it's for a good business and having a high return of investment. That's really what every investor is looking for. So that should be the main driver. Um, and otherwise, I think really taking a critical look at your own biases, I think that's really important. Even, you know, I myself have learned that, you know, with broader network, my views are very different. Um, and I think, yeah, diversifying networks will, will definitely give that effect um, also within the ecosystem. Um, so maybe that will be the last one I would leave with is, is yeah, diversifying your ecosystem and network. Marily? Yeah, I can only second to Christy that uh, uh, challenge yourself. Uh, whenever you think that you know something, then really try to find alternative ways to the, to, to, to the issue at hand. So I think this is what only brings us forward if we're open for personal development. And that is a topic that requires personal awareness and, and development. Thank you. Um, Kinga? Well, I th I'm thinking two things. Uh, I'm thinking, first of all, to LPs, uh, it's good business to make sure that the VQ VC ecosystem is diverse, uh, is equal, and, uh, and it will deliver you better returns. So do think about it. Uh, but at the same time, I'm thinking about this level of VC investors, of angels. Whenever you have a deal, you know that it's always better to co-invest. Why don't you call a, a female founder? Why don't you call a female angel? Why don't you call an angel that is from a diverse background or a friend of yours that's in another fund that has diversity in it, that has... Um, that, that is a female partner, why not call them? Don't call the same people you've always called to co-invest with you. Try something different and see if that delivers value. It's, statistically, it does. The question is, you need to consciously do it when you're in a deal because investors tend to call the same people all the time. So in order to go out of this comfort zone, you need to consciously want to, want to call a different person. And I would very, very much encourage that because I think we need to increase the number of investors from different backgrounds on each and every level. I honestly, what, what you're saying, it makes a lot of sense. And I thought it's the norm. Why we, you didn't, you, why, why would people don't do it by default? Like if uh, for, for me, for example, and when, when I do some, like a, an angel, like I, I, I contribute in the angel rounds, my the first thing comes to my mind is basically asking everyone if I'm doing if I'm making the, the a, a good deal or not and and I thought that everyone do this by 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 default but it seems like it's not the case anyway um, 
It was a pleasure, honestly, and I learned a lot. And as a male, um, I was speaking the other day in a conference and I was saying, we have to invest in males education. Thank you so much, ladies, for uh, educating me for the past hour on many, many things I, I didn't uh, know. And I think that's something males have to take into consideration. We, as males, should invest in our education on everything that has to do with inequality, especially toward females. And, um, and yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying Textual. And I'm grateful to uh, to everyone there uh, for inviting me and invite. I think uh, Merlin, Christy, and Kinga would second me for that. And thank you. I would love to thank them for giving us the opportunity to discuss such an important topic. Merle, Kinga, Christy, would you like to say anything? It's been a pleasure to be here today. I think that each one of us on this call, uh, at this conference, thinks about diversity and inclusion in both ways, in both directions. The women also want to work with the men and bring them on board into their deals, into their ecosystem. So uh, it's great that we can work on it together. And I think that that's what diversity means. It means that both are present and no one is excluded. Cool. Marilee, Christy, anything? Likewise, I would second that 100%. And it's been uh, so such fun kind of talking about this and and getting the message out. I think it's important, even though it might have seemed like it's an exhausted topic. I don't think we can exhaust it enough. <laughs> Thank you. Marilee, any final words? No, absolutely. Uh, I think it's uh, it is moving towards uh, towards better and more uh, inclusive world. So I think improvements are, are coming along eventually. Thank you, ladies. Uh, um, I'm also very optimistic. The future is definitely more feminine, more uh, in more inclusive, at least not only on the on, on the females level, uh, also more sustainable and greener. Hopefully, at least uh, this is what I this is what I what I think, and I would love to think. Again, thank you to everyone at TechChill. I hope you guys are enjoying the conference, and it was a pleasure being with you. See you guys soon.